What else can you say but wow? What a privilege to be able to declare, come what may, it is well with my soul. Amen. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm only going to be speaking from two verses this morning, but I would like to begin reading with verse 4 and then down through verse 9, just so we see the flow of thought in this passage of Scripture. So if you'd like to stand with me at this time, you may do so as we open God's Word together. Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, beginning in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord unless there's a pandemic. (laughs) You say, Pastor, what version do you have? No. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we give thanks that you are indeed the God of peace. And we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word this morning. We acknowledge the gracious work of the Holy Spirit in bringing the truth to bear upon us in such helpful and practical ways. I pray that you will speak through your word and that we will worship together as we engage your life-changing word. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, Pastor Kyle, in my absence, gave a great message from Philippians 3 about overcoming fear and worry and pressing on in our walk with God. Now, we didn't plan things this way, but I want to speak this morning from Philippians 4 and talk about the result of having freedom from worry, anxiety, and fear. So I think the message last Sunday and the one today will fit together. As you know, God has a way of orchestrating things in order to serve His purposes, right? I've seen that happen over the years again and again. Now Philippians chapter 4 and primarily verses 6 and 7 is a very familiar passage, but it's one that I've been thinking about quite a lot for some time now. And I believe that these two verses should be on our minds and in our hearts throughout all the days ahead. In fact, I would like to ask that we adopt these verses as a theme for our church family in 2021. And I think it would be great to memorize these two verses, verses 6 and 7 in Philippians 4, if you've not already done so. Now, in these verses here in Philippians 4, there are three callings that I see in the life of every believer. Let's look at these for just a few moments. First of all, we are called to a life of prayer. Now, that's made abundantly clear in verse 6, isn't it? We are called to a life of prayer. 
This is what Paul is showing us here. The answer to anxiety is centered in prayer. We should always remember that. The answer to anxiety is centered where? In prayer. In prayer. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By the way, I like that wording in the English Standard Version. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, the word anxious that is used here means to have a distracting care. A distracting care. It indicates fretfulness, undue concern, anxious care. You see, we can either carry our cares ourselves or remove our cares by giving them to God in prayer. And effectiveness in prayer involves a childlike trust in a heavenly Father who knows us, loves us, and cares for us. This is why 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And that's what the beautiful song says that Pastor George sang just a few moments ago. All your anxiety, right? All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat. Leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Now, when we come to God in prayer, we must come in faith, Jesus says in Matthew 21, verse 22, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So, prayer conquers anxiety. Now, think about this with me for a moment. Prayer conquers anxiety because it puts us in touch with the God who is bigger than any form of anxiety. Prayer gets problems out from inside of us where anxiety and depression are created and calls on the supernatural power of God. And when God intervenes, that changes everything. Everything. So through prayer, fervent prayer, we can know a strength and a calm even when the outside world is in turmoil. And our outside world is definitely in turmoil. Well, the psalmist knew great difficulty, great turmoil in his day. He prays in Psalm 88, verses 1 and 2, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Think about the words for a moment. Think about those words that the psalmist is using here. I cry out day and night. Incline your ear to my cry. This is a prayer of much fervency. I mean, these aren't just words. He's not just saying the same old things about the same old things. No, he's crying out to God from the depths of his being. And this is the kind of praying that God honors because he knows that it comes from the heart. Here's a second calling upon our lives as believers. We are called to a life of praise. You'll notice in verse 6 that Paul also mentions thanksgiving. We are to pray with thanksgiving. We must make certain that we never forget that part of the command. Yes, we are to make our requests known to God. The Bible teaches that. But we are to do so with thanksgiving. You see, the evidence of a peaceful soul is a praising heart, a grateful heart. And I would say one of the main ways we become anxious is by being preoccupied with our own particular problems but you cannot be preoccupied with your problems and full of praise and thanksgiving at the same time. So if you struggle regularly with anxiety, worry, and fear, I would encourage you to spend time daily in the Psalms. 
For you'll find that much of the language there is given over to thanksgiving and praise. You see that all through the Psalms, don't you? For example, Psalm 111 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. You'll notice here that the psalmist is determined to give thanks to God with all his heart and, here's the next part, and to do so publicly in the congregation, he says. Yes, praise and thanksgiving should be expressed privately and daily in each of our lives as believers. And it should be expressed publicly every time we gather for worship. For example, when we are led in prayer as a congregation, all of us should be praying and, and praising God from our hearts. When we sing a psalm, hymn or spiritual song, we should be expressing thanksgiving and praise to God from our hearts as we sing. That's what we're told in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then when the truth of God's Word is proclaimed, we should be giving praise to God and thanking Him for what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. Oh, I tell you, there is amazing joy and spiritual power in a life of praise and thanksgiving. Could I say that again? There is amazing, amazing joy and spiritual power in a life of praise and and gratitude. And there's great victory over anxiety in the life of a person who has made the choice to rejoice and has the gratitude attitude. I want to be more like that this year, making the choice to rejoice. And it is a choice. And also displaying daily what might be called the gratitude attitude. And that leads me to mention the third calling upon our lives as believers, the third calling. We're called, and don't you love this? We are called to a life of peace. Peace. Look with me at what Paul says in verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now you and I cannot produce peace. We cannot. But we can pray as we are instructed to do in this passage. And the result, the result of biblical praying is the peace of God. So if we obey the command of verse 6, then we can claim the promise of verse 7. Those two go together, don't they? Verses 6 and 7. Obey the command in verse 6 and then claim the promise in verse 7. Now, when we came to know God as our Father through faith in Jesus, we received what the Bible calls peace with God. For example, Romans 5, verse 1, great verse, familiar verse, Romans 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the peace of reconciliation, that is to say, being made right with God. We are no longer separated from Him, no longer at war with Him. Through Christ, we now have peace with God. And as amazing as that is, and it is amazing, Paul is describing something even more in verse 7 of Philippians 4. It's the peace of God. That is to say, it's an ongoing peace that we can experience every day of our lives, no matter what the circumstances may be. You see, God himself is the source of peace, right? He's the source. He's the one who brings peace. Anxiety is created by fears, frets, 
and frustrations that come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But peace is from God. And yet people seek peace in other ways and in other things, whether it's position, status, wealth, you name it. Now, as you may know, Pamela and I returned from Texas last week where we spent Christmas with our children and grandchildren. And everything is bigger in Texas. At least that's what they say. For example, I heard about a Texas rancher who was entertaining another rancher from out of state. And the Texan asked him about the size of his ranch. And he said, well, it's, you know, it's about a mile in this direction and a couple of miles in that direction. And then the Texan said, let me tell you about the size of my ranch. It is so big that I can get in my truck first thing in the morning and start driving and drive until sundown before I get to the end of my ranch. And the visitor said, I had a truck like that once. <laughs> Folks, it's not things, right? It's not things, it's not property, it's not wealth or anything else that brings true peace or true fulfillment other than God Himself. He is our peace. In Romans 15, 33, He's called the God of peace. And the Bible says of Christ in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, for He Himself is our peace. I love that. He doesn't just give peace, He is our peace. Isaiah refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. But our trouble is, as one man put it, we want the peace without the Prince. But there is no peace apart from Jesus, for He is the one who purchased our peace on the cross of Calvary. So in Philippians 4 verse 7, Paul says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing promise, isn't it? That's an amazing promise, and what a promise to carry with us in 2021. Now, since this peace is from an infinite God, how could we with our finite minds ever completely understand it? But even though we can't fully understand or comprehend such a glorious supernatural peace, we can experience it. We can have it. For you see, the Apostle Paul says this peace, listen to this, this peace guards our hearts and minds. Now the word guard is actually a military term. And it's one of the strongest terms in the New Testament. It means preserve, keep, to keep under guard as a garrison. Oh, what a great word is that word guard. God's peace guards us. It keeps us. Now, Paul was writing these words to the believers in the city of Philippi, a city that was actually a Roman colony with a military garrison. So the believers there would have picked up on Paul's analogy right away. And they would have understood, of course, that it is not Roman soldiers that guarded them, it's the peace of God Himself. And I would say this, Paul's use of a military term implies that the mind is a battle zone. Have you found that to be true? The mind is a battle zone and needs to be protected. The good news is this, God's peace does that. God's peace protects us. God's peace provides and guards our minds and our hearts. And this is something to rejoice over. It really is. If you would listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. That's another great promise to keep handy throughout the new year. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. Think about this. If God can guard us against the devil, as this verse declares, then He can guard us against anything that would threaten our lives and our ministries. 
Yes, we've seen a lot in 2020. There's no doubt about that. We've seen a lot, <laughs> more than I could have ever imagined. We've seen the advances of some of the most radical ideologies on the face of the earth. We've seen massive political and social unrest, governmental corruption, natural disasters. But folks, through it all, God has been faithful to keep us, sustain us, and use us for His purposes while we are still here on this earth. Thank God for that. He doesn't give up on us. He never says, I didn't see that coming. You're in a mess now. I'll see if I can figure something out. God never walks the celestial halls of glory, wringing his hands and saying, what? What am I going to do? Maybe form a committee? I don't know. God is never surprised at anything. He is God. He is in charge. He owns everything, and He even uses the most difficult of times for His purposes and for His glory. Am I telling the truth or not? So come what may, we can keep trusting Him with all of our hearts, with all of our lives, every day that we live. Now, it does appear it does appear that religious persecution may be coming. But folks, our lives and ministries are in the hands of God. They are. And we can trust Him to give us courage, strength, and His continual peace that surpasses all understanding. I read an interesting story. In the year 1653, a man by the name of Whitlock was embarking as Great Britain's ambassador for Sweden. This man was filled with anxiety as he reflected on the condition of his own nation and on the responsibility that had been thrust upon him as ambassador. Well, it happened that on the evening before he was to leave, there was a servant who slept in an adjacent bed to Whitlock. When the servant saw that his master could not sleep because of anxiety, he said to him, Sir, will you give me leave to ask you a question? Whitlock said, Certainly. The servant said, Sir, don't you think God governed the world very well before you came into it? Whitlock answered, Undoubtedly. The servant continued, and sir, don't you think that he will govern it quite as well when you are gone out of it? Again, Whitlock answered, certainly. The servant said, then sir, excuse me, but don't you think you may as well trust him to govern it as long as you are in it? That wise question from a lowly servant had a phenomenal impact on Britain's ambassador to Sweden. He closed his eyes, went quickly fast asleep, and did not awaken until it was time to embark the next day. You know, that's a great question for us as we face the challenges of a new year. Don't you think that you and I may as well trust God to govern this world as long as we are in it? Remember this, come what may, heaven rules. God reigns. Jesus is coming. The devil is defeated. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, we must not be intimidated by this decaying and self-destructed culture in which we live. We must shine the glorious light of the gospel in the midst of the spiritual darkness all around us. People have seen and heard so much bad news. It's time they heard the good news. And the good news is that a Savior has come. He has paid the price for our sin in full in order that we might be forgiven of all sin, that we might not come under condemnation, but have full forgiveness, have freedom in Christ, and be assured of an eternity with Him throughout all the ages to come. Folks, that's good news. 
That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of reconciliation. The good news that you and I are privileged to declare to others through life and word. We're ambassadors. The Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 5, we're not ambassadors to Sweden necessarily. We're not ambassadors to another country. As believers, we are God's ambassadors in that we have a message from our king. And it's a glorious message. It's a life-changing message. It's a message of good news. Heaven rules. God reigns. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me? Father, on this first Sunday of the new year, we acknowledge with all our hearts heaven rules, God reigns, Jesus is Lord. There is nothing on this planet that could ever, ever change that reality. Thank you for who you are and for the privilege that is ours of trusting in you every day we draw breath. Oh, Lord, as long as we are in this world, may we look to you and trust in you and rest in you and seek you with all of our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways we celebrate the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross is through the regular observance of the Lord's Supper. What a sacred and meaningful observance this is. Through the bread and the juice, we have a powerful picture of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf when he died for us. This observance is such a meaningful time of worship as we are called upon to reflect upon his atoning death. And as we are called upon to reflect upon the love of God in sending his son to do for us what no one else could ever even think about doing. You don't have to be a member of this local church to participate with us in the observance of the Lord's Supper, but according to the scriptures, those who do participate are to be individuals who have become part of God's family. That is to say, they have come into his family through repenting of sin and placing their faith in Christ alone as their Lord and Master. If that is your testimony this morning, then we welcome you to partake with us in the Lord's Supper. It's also important that as believers, we have prepared hearts spiritually as we come to this time. This is why the Bible says, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And the question is, what does this examination involve? Well, first, it involves making sure that our relationship with God is right. All known sin is to be confessed to him. Secondly, as far as it is possible, we are to be right with one another in our relationships. Right with one another. In a few moments, the bread and the juice will be passed, and this will be a good time to pray, asking God, of course, to reveal anything that he would want us to see and deal with. And also, it will be a good time to ask him to renew our love for him. What a privilege. What a privilege right here on January 3rd, first Sunday of 2021, to call to mind who we are in Christ, all because of who he is and what he did on our 
behalf, I'm going to ask our men if they will come at this time as we prepare for the Lord's Supper.